Hello everyone and welcome back to Behind the Trowel. We are with the cast of the Great British Dig Series 4, Episode 1. It has been a really long time since we have gone live, so let's see how it goes. Hopefully we'll be okay, fingers crossed to it. But as it's a live stream, please leave your comments, questions for us in the comment section, and we will be checking other social media platforms as well. If you're gonna be checking this video at a later date, don't worry, we will be streaming every week, a live Q and A with the team that's on and off screen. Um, so yeah, please leave your comments below. And transcripts, I think, is a little bit different now since an update. So I think I'll be actually manually typing them in after the video goes live. So apologies, I don't think we will have closed captioning during the live stream itself. Also, it just never worked out. Um, so I don't want to try it. Okay, perfect. Let's get into it. Hello, everyone. Hi, Tash. How, Hi, Tash. How, how do we feel about going live? It's been a while. It's been it a hot has second. Been a while. <laughs> <laughs> so some of you may notice that we have two new individuals here on the live it has been a year but i, I hope you have recognized that we no, didn't Tasha, i just changed my hair oh that's true <laughs> that's true actually i think you were brunette for the last series i can't remember um but anyway so i think we should go ahead with john henry first as this is your first kind of you know live stream with yep. the great british dig team how does it feel please introduce yourself to the audience at home it, oh, it feels great it feels fabulous yeah uh i'm john henry phillips i am the new part of the team on the show that one of the new presenters um what else do you want to know how, how deep who do are you I... like tell us about your book uh, <laughs> straight away about the book uh yeah i'm an archaeologist i suppose um I searched for a shipwreck in France a few years ago and I wrote a book about it, which actually you might think this is I've set this up. I genuinely haven't. There's actually a copy right here. <laughs> <laughs> here it is. The search out now. Um, yeah, I made a I made a film called um, No Roses on a Sailor's Grave about the same story. And uh, yeah, then I joined the Great British Dig. And, and my, you do have uh, a background in commercial archaeology. It's how I we did. kind of met each other online. Yeah, I did. Sorry, my my wall's falling apart. Um, yeah, I did commercial archaeology for a few years, two, uh, three years now, two, three or four years, and then I stopped. And then, yeah. oh, I run a little project um, called Romani Community Archaeology, which is a non-profit, um, and we excavate uh, historic Romani Gypsy sites with um, modern-day Romani Gypsy young people um, as a sort of um sort of project aimed at sort of um combating like modern misconceptions and um giving people an opportunity to tell their own histories um yeah a few th few little bows you know i do a few things amazing thank you so much john henry and we are also with dr chris smart please tell us a little bit about yourself your research and your role in this episode well, um, I'm Chris Smart. I'm an archaeologist at the University of Exeter, where I've been for just over 20 years. Um, I primarily research Roman Britain, particularly the southwest. Um, and since the mid 2000s, I've been working in one particular landscape, which is where the first episode is filmed at Calstock, um, which is on the uh, looks over the River Tamar on the Devon Cornwall border. So it was really great when Chris first got in touch and said, would we be interested in discussing having the, the Roman fort and the, some of the work there featured on the programme? And obviously it was lovely to meet all you guys last year. And um, yeah, I think the output was really good and we've, we made some really good discoveries. Um, so yeah, so it was a pleasure to be part of the programme. Thank you so much as well. From one Chris to another Chris, Chris Scott, please <laughs> let us know who you are I'm, and your role. Yeah, so um, my name is Chris Scott, not to be confused with Chris Smart. Um, and <laughs> I am the um, archaeological consultant for the Great British Dig. So I get involved with um, finding sites, as Chris said, and make, making contact with um, other archaeologists working on other sites where the Great British Dig might be able to get involved or also um, speaking to other archaeologists in all sorts of different settings to find places where we can go and, um, and do an investigation which can add to the add to the understanding of history in in one community or another. And Dr Chloe Duckworth. Hi, uh, just to say uh, it might be a little bit noisy in the background for me because I'm currently at our student field project. Ah. 
um, and everyone's getting dinner ready and stuff. So um, I'm out on Hadrian's Wall, actually, at another Roman fort. Um, is that is that cheating on Calstock? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, one I end to the other. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But the whole the whole stretch. Um, yeah. So Chloe Duckworth, obviously, um, I just said that. But yeah, I'm, I've co-presented with uh, John Henry and Tash, and this was a really fun episode to make, and I loved yeah, watching it as well. It was really good. I love the new format. Like, it's just, oh, I love it. I think also every season, so looking back when I had to do some editing for some promo, you can you can start to see how, how much we've changed and how we've all, you know, grown on the show, except for John Henry, you know, but it's all right. <laughs> He got his moment in the he got his moment in front of the camera doing the doing the pub quiz there. So I thought, true, yeah. true. That's you true. Did. Making up for um not being featured in the trailer, I think that was uh, the trade off. <laughs> but uh, no, it was good. I like the pub scene. That was very funny. Um, I see. I recalled holding a pint, so I wasn't when it came out. So I was glad for that because I definitely held a pint in the other one that's coming up, and I held a pint in a scene in the documentary I made, and I was really worried I was getting this. Reputation for just drinking on the job all the time. So <laughs> I was really relieved that I, I, I didn't, basically. But you've just told us that you were drinking on the job at all times. Yeah. I, well, I, you know, if you're filming a scene in a pub, doing a pub quiz, rude not to, you know. As an but archaeologist, last... I wholly agree. Well, exactly. And when we did um, the, the bingo night, which is coming up in another episode, um, Hugh promised me that we'd both get a pint and stand at the front drinking them. And then when the cameras came on, I didn't notice, but he'd put his down. So I'm just like next to him, like, oh, hey, hey, drinking away. What's going on? Sorry, I got to do a school assembly <laughs> and you get to go out drinking with you. Really, That's... Chloe? Are we going to go there? <laughs> what did I do? Well, I went to yoga. <laughs> <laughs> and we did some <laughs> yoga. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> I mean, Chris, uh, Chris Scott, were you there? You were there. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. The yoga. I was there for all of the above. <laughs> that's, that's I think that's the best bit about my job is um, is I'm behind the camera but get to see all of this silliness. So <laughs> yeah, just just watch it and not have to participate like Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So I'm just posting on Instagram. I could I could hear when I was doing the uh, the bingo night, Chris. I, I could hear your laugh very loudly. Um, while I was trying to call out the bingo numbers. I'm a pro. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what number you were laughing at so hard, but I, I, dread, to, I dread to think. This is a family show. <laughs> Wait, was this bingo? Wait, we didn't have bingo this time. It was... No, not, um, this, not this week. It was that a pub was, uh, quiz. It was a pub yeah. Yeah, quiz, today it was, it was pub quiz, yeah. yeah. Bingo That's right, can't come. touch. Keep them in line. They're getting yeah. carried away. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. yeah. Pub quiz today. Be- <laughs> Henry the Eighth or something about the wife. I've already forgotten what the question was. But anyway, moving swiftly on, <laughs> got to stay focused. Um, so at the beginning of the episode, when we're introducing Calstock, I think it's me who says about how you know some archaeologists stumble across or discover something in 2007. Those archaeologists being Chris Smart over <laughs> here. So, Chris, what was that like? How did that actually happen? Just like a quick summary of how you discovered that site. I'm curious. Uh, we were actually in the area looking for um, a medieval silver mining industry that was opened under Edward I in the late 13th century. And we didn't find that in any way, shape, or form. And we still haven't. Um, so, we were doing some geophysics um, around the church at Calstock because we'd had records of grave diggers finding charcoal and um, bits of slag, which was kind of an indicator that we, we thought we may have one of these mineral processing centres. But as soon as I did the first the first day of magnetometry and saw the, the rounded corner and straight sides of, of the enclosure, it was quite clear that it was a Roman fort. So it kind of went from there. And a group of friends and I and my colleague at the time, Peter Clawton, we, yeah, yeah, we, we um, took a couple of weeks off work and did a small evaluation, proved what it was, and then... From there, we realised that obviously modern burials in, in the parish cemetery were going to continue to to um, destroy the archaeology. So we had a large grant from uh, English Heritage, as they were at the time, um, to do some rescue archaeology. And yeah, it all kind of, kind of snowballed, really. And it's kind of been, despite me working on different projects, um, you know, around the theme of Roman Britain, early medieval Britain, Calstock's always been there in the background. Um, so yeah, it was really nice to get a lottery grant in 2017 to run some big community excavations and 
it's just as, as you experience all you experience the the local people are really engaged with the archaeology there i think that's what makes it quite special for me mm. it just reminds me of brett to chris as well so we had yeah, he's actually moved on, on. Um, Has he? Yeah, he's he's moved to another parish in Devon. So he's mm. got no, we've got no vicar at the moment there. So, oh. yeah. hmm. out of curiosity, so you you mentioned about how the the semi, the current modern cemetery site would intervene with the archaeology. Hmm. What depths are they going to to dig these graves to well, actually disturb? Six, uh, six six foot two meters uh, deep, and as you saw, oh. the archaeology is within sort of twenty thirty centimeters of the ground surface so mm. every burial basically had the potential to be disturbing archaeology it's amazing that it's never been identified as this before um when we first did our work in 2008 the first excavation a grave digger who'd retired actually brought me up almost two-thirds of a samian bowl that he kept in his garage in his shed or in his garage um and said oh well, i guess i now know what this is and he just sort of kept it as curiosity but it hadn't done anything else with it so um but all those people and historically that were digging graves in fact we i've been digging the past couple of weeks back at calstock and um we had a big layer of 16th century church demolition material and even that was including Roman tile. So at that point, when they're doing groundworks in the church, they're going through the Roman deposits. Um, so interesting. I mean, the fact that as well that you've just been back there. By the way, guys, please jump in, because I'm just like going to keep asking Chris questions otherwise. <laughs> I'm, I'm so interested. I don't know. I, you know, this is so off topic a little bit. I remember there was a time when I was contemplating being a grave digger because they got paid more than an archaeologist. <laughs> Probably still do, I should imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're a consultant and I hear salaries are off the chart. <laughs> at, the, at the time, they were getting paid something like 27,000 and we were only getting paid like 20, 21. And yeah. I was like, same skill. Oh, hold on, we're supposed to be promoting archaeology tests, not revealing well, the truth. <laughs> So I keep it real. But now we're getting paid. Now we're getting paid more. Uh, this was a few years ago. But uh, yeah, just curious. <laughs> I've just got a comment on uh, YouTube by Steve. Hi, Steve. And he just said, yeah, good to have the locals behind the archaeology or they could get upset with having their graveyard closed down. Well, this is a part of generally speaking a lot of archaeological works happen pre-development phase so in this situation actually i'm not sure how does it work in this situation because well, not... we, we actually went there and then we, the lottery grant that i got in 2017 actually has enabled the parish council the parish to continue burying so we basically recorded and cleared another whole area for, for burial so we basically preservation by record dug up all the archaeology mm -hmm. uh, recorded it and and that that then means that the land can be used for the purposes of burial so quite the opposite to shutting the burial ground in fact we by working with the local authorities of parish council and the church we're, we're enabling future burial if we hadn't have got that lottery funding then that was when the planning system would kick into place and it would have been prohibitively expensive for the parish council to pay for the necessary archaeology and probably would have had the burial ground extension ceased so it's no, such no. a common misconception about archaeology that it shuts things down it's mm. never I think well, I even looked into this uh, recently and there were, there were no examples or maybe there was one example of the historical one that essentially um, recording the archaeology does not shut things down. Archaeologists don't come in and stop developers and I know everyone here knows that but mm. it's, it is really commonly Good said point. and I hear it a lot from people and um, it's really important, actually, you know, to sort of for people to know that we don't shut things down. We, we actually, as Chris said, we often end up reducing the cost for developers because mm. let's face it, archaeology can, among other things, tell you if there's a burial ground mm. uh, where you're looking or, you know, that kind of research. And if you don't do that um, and you start building and then you find it, well, then you're in a world of doo doo. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Is that what do people use that word? Um, so yeah, it's, it's really important to say that, isn't it? That um, yeah. it just doesn't shut things down at all. Um, but I totally understand why people think that because it's very much said, very commonly said. Yeah. The media, I think, as, the as media. well, there's a, a good point, really, in that obviously the work Chris has done there has created so much more value for the local community and given them so much more interest out of that, out of that part of their patch as well yeah. you know so it's not just the kind of the the money element and all that kind of stuff but there's obviously so much more value that that the work chris has done over the years has created and i think even we saw that in the um in chatting to some of the um 
the volunteers who came on the on the project when we were there even um one of the ladies who was on the program was talking about she just moved to the community and I'm afraid I can't remember her name now. Nikki. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Nikki. Who just moved to the community and didn't really know that many people, but got involved mm-hmm. when um, we were doing the work and came away with lots of new friends, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. That's what the program really is about. Yeah. And she's an amazing artist. I need to find her link. She gave me a, a Highland Cow painting. Just going to add it in there a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely lady she was. Yeah. Um, so in terms of we've spoken about the community, which obviously for us is one of the main aspects of the show, because it's balanced. It's like it's a balancing creating a TV show that people will watch, having a nice, strong narrative in that sense, which is where Chris Scott comes in quite a lot to make sure that the narrative of what we're doing works with what the production wants and works with the archaeology that we have on site because most of the things that we are filming is literally on the spot so we don't have a lot of time to really think of the storyline as such so sometimes it's weaving in in the evenings you guys are sitting there chatting about that for yourselves my cat is now crying at me um (laughs) I lost my train of thought thanks Bagheera (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think the, 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 you just talk about the story. It's um, it's a really interesting challenge is work, is working on the Great British Dig because a, a lot of TV obviously has a script and you know where it's going and all the rest of it and and it's taken a lot of talking and a lot of understanding both ways between us as archaeologists and the and the production guys to sort of be able, I think, over time to allow space for the archaeology to tell its story. And and it hopefully that comes across in the programme and that we it certainly came across in this program, I think, best with John Henry Splodge, where that really did need to kind of it the the story and the learning of, of that trench, I think is well reflected in the program in that it genuinely kind of that is what happened on the ground. We went mm. backwards and forwards. Chris and I had lots and lots of head scratching and chats about that, mm. and um, and everybody came and got involved and put their put their penneth worth in. So if, the archaeology telling its story is obviously one of the most important things that we've that we try and achieve. But also, ultimately, there is kind of there needs to be questions that we try and set out to answer and, and things like that, just in order to make a. A television program that makes sense to people yeah so so it is a it is a challenge but i think it's a really it is a really interesting one but it can be it can be a head scratcher at times as well when you're trying to meld those two things together and they do have to they do have to come together it reminds me there was one episode we did in benwell and I think one or two trenches could not make the cut because of the narrative. It just would not work with the time that you had, you know, the 40 minutes you have to explain the archaeology. Sometimes, yeah. unfortunately, you know, we can't. Chloe, you are going to say something? Yes, no, it was a previous series in when we filmed in Lenton in Nottingham. Um, I think you had a trench, a beautiful trench, Tash, that, yeah, it had yeah. A, a whole um, sort of really well, well preserved, but we were looking for medieval stuff. There was so much of that story that that later trench didn't make the cut. And I think that, yeah, you know, what, so much stuff has to be left out in order to, to, to tell the story that we want to tell, but you could almost tell that story seven or eight different ways and each one would be really interesting. I always think this we what we leave out is, well, I guess that's why we do these, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's, that's really true. There's so, there's so much, and I think this season's been a, because I, I work through and get involved in in the editing after the show as well, just to make sure that 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 the kind of the some of the archaeological detail and things like that follows through and and is explained as best as we can. Um, and yeah, I I see some. I haven't been on site. I'm also aware of all the stuff we're leaving out. And I think every program we've done this season, we could make probably three of mm-hmm. of each site. There's so, so much interesting stuff has come out and on the various sites that we've been lucky enough to work on. I remember we found that nice little um, Samian, was it a cup or something mm, like that? Yeah. yeah. Really nicely decorated. 
Um, and yeah, that wasn't that didn't even make it into the yeah. episode. Yeah. Yeah. My, then my mother-in-law questioned why that hadn't appeared. Why, why didn't they show it? And I said, really? I had to tell her that kind of five days down to a one-hour program is quite a hard edit. Yeah, mm, cool. yeah. yeah, very much. I think it's it is a real struggle, and you want as an archaeologist, you want so much in there everything in there but obviously I, I, there is the need to actually knit all of the archaeological stuff together into a story mm -hmm. that then takes time and of course in the yeah I'm, absolutely i mean i've read archaeological reports you know we all have and uh and uh we, we we're great at doing archaeology i'm not so sure we're great at uh working out where the story is for, for tv purposes so yeah. it's good that we have people who can do that yeah. that's true imagine yeah you, what we find interesting I doubt anybody else would. <laughs> One day we need to get the production team in on a Zoom. We need to get them available because to hear their insights and how they, I mean, they're used to us now, but there was a time when they were just like, why are you so interested in this? Like, what is this? <laughs> but now they use the same terminology as us. They know how to identify certain pottery. Like, Yeah, yeah training the production crew has been yeah. so much fun because you do see them picking it up. And because a lot of, like the, a lot of the people we work with have been the same from series to series. So um, yeah, they, they definitely pick stuff up. It's, it's great. What, what do you, like Chris Smart, you kind of like, have you, I don't know if you've done TV stuff before, but how did you find working from it, from that side? It's really interesting. I mean, I have done a little bit of like local TV and some other filming that was actually never used, but I think as I remarked to Audrey or to Nick, actually, what I felt was that you've got a team of archaeologists and all the kind of the bouncing off each other that goes with that. Archaeologists kind of have that. And I actually found exactly the same with the TV production guys. You know, they're that sort of group of people that obviously work together closely and they're used to it. So I, I found actually the camaraderie and all of the, the, the sort of the banter really that goes with an archaeological site and obviously a film crew are much the same. So actually, I think it's very, very kind of, I found it really enjoyable. I think I told you all that at the time after the few years when we didn't do a lot of digging because of COVID. It was just brilliant. But it was really interesting to see and, and kind of the, actually how little is actually staged in truth i think a lot of people expect a program to have a like this to have a lot of staged elements and obviously you have to refilm certain things but actually a lot of it isn't staged it's as it's happening i thought that was really that adds a lot to the program i feel and the feedback i've had from both volunteers and people have watched it is that it, it didn't feel in any way set up or staged and that's exactly as it was you know as filmed i think and i think that's really credit to the to the development of the programme, the team over the time that it's been on. So, yeah, I just thought it brilliant. I think it's really important as well, because I don't know about these guys, but I am a terrible actor. So if I if I was if I was, you know, having to act in a very staged way, mm. like, it would be like it would be like watching a high school play that level. of <laughs> Yeah. 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 I was just I was just about to say something. I was like, oh, am I muted? Yes, I am muted. <laughs> the joys of live streaming. So hello to everyone who has just joined us. Hello to Nigel. Nice to see you again. Nigel's been on nearly all of our live streams. So it's good to see you again. And he's enjoyed this episode. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, oh, and he mentions the Roman road. Now, that was, I was worried as, at how that would look on camera. It's one of those things in person, you can see that it's a road and it's interesting, but on camera, I mean, how can you make that interesting? And that's again, where all your skills are kind of coming in to make it look good. And the graphics as well, which reminds me, unfortunately, Marcus couldn't make it today. He was in charge of the 3D modeling, reconstructions. Um, but yeah, great job, Marcus. And we'll put the link to his work in the, in the description below as well, in case you need someone to do that. <laughs> but John Henry, you seem quite quiet over there. So oh. tell us about your experience. How was it to, to this is not the first episode that we filmed, but um, let's try and go back to Cornwall anyway. I think it was our third episode we filmed. I can't That's remember. Right. Yeah. yeah, it was our third. So how was that experience for you? You know, you're working with a local community. You're on camera presenting the archaeology. And then, you know, everything else that goes in between. How was that process for you? What were your highlights? Yeah, it was good. Um, I think, like you said, by that point, we were quite quite a few episodes in. So I think you know, obviously coming in at the start, um, I wouldn't say it was I wouldn't say it was daunting, uh, but it was like you know, everyone like you say, you've all worked with each other for so long. Some of the uh, 
crew as well, not just the presenters and the and the team and stuff like that. So yeah, I wasn't sure like what to expect coming in. I remember we met the first episode in like the reception of a hotel. Do you remember that? Uh, and that's the first time we'd even spoken to each other, Chloe, actually, uh, in Bogner. But um, you must not be in there, Tash. You look confused. I can't remember. Wait, no, is that the wasps? <laughs> yes, I think you. I think you should tell the wasp story because that that was epic, to be honest. <laughs> that we will leave for the episode. <laughs> uh, I need a whole yeah. five minutes for that uh, one. Yeah, because I remember. I, I think I got to in touch with you just beforehand, John Henry. I didn't. I didn't even know that you were going to be working with us. And then uh, uh, someone told me your name, and I looked you up. Um, and I sent you a message saying, hi, we're going to work together. And then when I, I remember seeing you coming into the hotel and being sort of like, hi, and being very high energy and you having probably just arrived. Um, <laughs> well, I, I was, the, that set the tone for our working relationship. Well, I, I was high energy or you were high energy. No, I was. I was like, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And then you were like, oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm like, I always find it funny, like watching the show because. Uh, well, like watching the episode on Thursday, I'm quite um, I'm quite calm on camera uh, and reserved, but obviously like, off camera is absolutely not what I'm like at all. <laughs> so I was watching it, being like, "God, this is a different memory to what I have." I'm so um, I'm so calm about the whole situation. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, Tash, um, yeah, by that point, you know, we were in the sort of um, in the in the thick of it. We had a nice little thing going on, and it was really nice by that point. Um, I really enjoyed uh, being down that area. It was nice by the river. Um, trying to think now, can't remember where we stayed. Oh, we stayed in a little town, didn't we? Is that? You stayed in Tavistock, in I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Tavistock, mm, where we had the that pizza old, across that the road. Old hotel sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I've got to say, guys, it is starting to sound like like you know when we all like reminisce. It starts. It starts to sound like a bunch of old people. <laughs> yeah. Half cut. Oh, Tavistock. Yeah, pizza. <laughs> <laughs> it does blur into one though doesn't it when you do it all in a row well i mean you know we did stay like one particular hotel chain that we stayed in quite a lot throughout especially when we were filming the previous summer which was 10 episodes and the every room is the same so you'd wake <laughs> up in the morning and you're week four of this and you'd think where am i what city am i in because you're in the same hotel room you've been in for a month it, it's a different hotel but <laughs> It's it's sort of quite mind boggling, really. Yeah, I think that was one of the nice things about the, this episode, though, is it was so such an individual and beautiful place where we were, um, and we were so lucky to be working there. It's just a, a really, really love, really incredible drive. You couldn't not know you were in Cornwall mm. in that landscape. So it's it's just just a beautiful spot to work. We had such a nice such a nice time there. A long way down, though. I mean, I drove with um, assistant producer Emily and project manager Elaine um, for how long did it take? Maybe like six, seven hours. <laughs> I, was, I was coming to... from uh, Newcastle upon Tyne, mate. So, Ooh. <laughs> by train, that was long. No, I had, yeah, I had to drive back actually. I drove um, across the river. Yeah. <laughs> literally across the room. I used a bridge. We, we, yeah. we did that. We did that every morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was. This is random, but I was really happy to see the ducklings made the edit because um, because mm. I was obsessed with those ducklings. It was but way too late in the year. They terrorise everybody. Goslings? No, I think they were ducklings. No, they they're um yeah. There's a there's a special name for that type of duck, but they're very aggressive and they terrorise everybody. What's they duck? Um, yeah, I can't remember what they're called now. Is this is, is Cornwall that soft? Do you have gangs of ducklings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrorise the local <laughs> population. I, I, was, I was in Coastal for a, like a, a May Day event and they were the ducks were mugging each other. Was, <laughs> yeah, pro proper violence. Yeah. I think you've lost control of the archaeological chat here, Tash. We did, yeah. We'll bring it back. <laughs> Animal bones. Uh, Duckling. Damn bones. it, Hannah's not here. <laughs> but talking of the finds. Yeah. I mean, we always hope that we will have something visually to tie in nicely with the time period, whatever we're investigating. And actually, each trench was quite fruitful and we got a varied spectrum of types of finds, everything from coinage to actual pottery, probably did get some animal bone. It was a nice range. Mm. And if I remember correctly, it didn't make the edit where we actually had same in where. Did that make the edit? Where we got to see the mm. same in where 
the oh. same in that came off of the road as we were machining, I think, made the edit. Mm. Yeah. Ah, okay. The, the other, one. the other cup, the bowl that. And the Mortarium. Slodge, that wasn't. It had Mortarium as well. Mm. You no, did, uh, yeah, but that didn't make the didn't make uh, the edit, unfortunately. But we had lots when you of read notes. the report, mm. you will find all this out at some point in the future. But it's archaeology, so you've got to wait a few years, probably. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> not. Hopefully <laughs> next year. Oh, hopefully next year. He's on. You can ask him. Is that true? Tell us, actually. From <laughs> please tell us what has happened since the actual excavations and post excavation work. Uh, yeah. In terms of what we have found, obviously we tease that it's quite a significant find mm. structurally, yeah. but what is that actually, the bigger picture? Yeah, so I mean, all of the records that um, the York team produced are, have all now been integrated with those from the excavations from 2011 onwards. So all of the finds have gone off to various specialists to be fully reported upon. Um, so like the quern stone that featured on the program that's now in reading with a specialist there along with other other stone objects that have been found sort of in the, the other excavations the ceramics are in exeter being public uh, being looked at and some of the metal work is with a conservator um just outside penzance so yeah all that material's off the site drawings are all being um, digitally inked up ready to go into publication and so publication hopefully will be sometime towards the end of next year so all of your work um, will be integrated as part of that overall publication, wrapping everything from other excavations together. So you know, it's um, well underway. Um, but it's really easy to do because the best thing from my perspective about the programme, unlike others which I won't mention, is that you provide a team of professional archaeologists as well as you as pre presenters with an archaeological background. So you end up with an, a, 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 an archaeological archive, a site record, which is as good as any other. So in some ways it's it was a pleasure to have it because i knew that we would get that and it could be integrated so we're not left with a huge amount of work it's simply adding you know those professional records and those objects into what we already have for publication so yeah that that was the terms the, the really important thing from this program is that you, you that it's produced in a way that actually isn't detrimental to any archaeology and it's recorded to a high professional standard so yeah it's it's um it's really good in that regard We've always, in all regards, obviously. But. Yeah, no, thank you. We've always said that for us, archaeology is always the first priority. Mm. Yeah. So it's nice to hear that. Others think that too, <laughs> who work with us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. We have a few comments uh, from YouTube. Do, do, do. Oh, Sasha says hello. Oh, and oh, he yeah. says, are you planning to go to Indiana Jones together? Are you planning to watch it? I'll just let that mull over a little bit. <laughs> Chris's face. <laughs> Chris Scott's face, not Chris Smart, Chris Scott. <laughs> well, I should add that I've had the email communication through in the university today looking for uh, a, a TV company, trying to find someone to go on telly to say that their career was influenced by um, the Indiana Jones series. So, yes, I don't know how many academics are prepared to go on to BBC One to state that their whole career plan was based on. Indiana Jones, but yeah, we'll be I got, interested I got to see. Similar quite recently, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I wouldn't mind punching a few Nazis. I could do. <laughs> Not sure about the rest. I, I, I want to see it, actually. I think they were filming some of it. Um, so I'm here. I said earlier, but I'm here at our student um, field school, yes. Newcastle University Field School, and it's up on uh, one of the Fort Hadrian's Wall, which is called Bird Oswald Fort, which is a great name, anyway. Bird Oswald. But. Um, <laughs> But they were the, the students were working here and he was filming really nearby and somebody tried to i mean it didn't work out but it would have been amazing tried to bring a harrison ford down imagine that as a student on your first dig and harrison ford what rolls up in his indiana jones outfit. <laughs> it would have been awesome yeah. he'd, have, he'd have been thrilled to be there no doubt <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suddenly enough he said no. <laughs> they were, they were filming, weren't the they, uh, near, um, they were filming in Scotland around the, when we were filming in Scotland. So whenever, I can't remember when that was, that was July. When we were filming and yeah, and we were working up in Falkirk on mm. another Roman wall. Yeah. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> well, thoughts, not, not, not necessarily thoughts. Oh, we have a question from Rosie. What's our favourite finds from the Calstock dig? Thanks, Rosie. By any chance, is this Rosie who was on a dig with us? 
please who, let us know in the comments. Who you, who you I did have a rosy. So who's <laughs> our favorite? Go on, John Henry. What was your favorite find from Calstock? Uh, I liked the little, uh, I can't remember what it was now. You have to remind me, Chris. It was like a little Samian cup or something. Yeah, it? yeah, it was a, yeah, a little cup. Yeah, yeah didn't make sort of the, about uh, 10 centimeters diameter. Yeah, it was, it was neat. It didn't, didn't make the cup, it was like a little tiny little thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice decoration on it. Um, and it came out of that scene, if I remember correctly, I think it came out of the scene with a big digger. Uh, we're excavating yeah. the splodge with that, and it was just um, at the bottom, well, probably not at the bottom. Exactly. Bit, far you down. just said a big digger excavating a splodge. <laughs> <laughs> You got, you got, you know, we're, we're, we're here to dumb down archaeology. That's our job. You <laughs> might have bottomed it out, mate. <laughs> yeah. God yeah. bless the splodge. I think everything from that feature, the splodge, as soon as it started to become Roman, and then knowing the significance of the geology, that's the best find. You know, the fact that it nails it as a Roman dated feature. So, yeah, that silver coin that did feature the same in bowl, that sort of stuff isn't going to be residual. You know, it's mm. secure, which is great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And talking of the big digger, I did actually have a text message from John, our digger driver, yeah. who was both amazed that he was on television, but also ashamed that he did nothing but wear bright high vis. That's, yeah. that's what he said to me. Oh, bless. That's Hats off great. to him as well for working with us because it's great. not just an archaeology dig, it's also we're filming, so it's even more stop starts than normal. Yeah, yes. those are yeah. more of the unsung heroes, aren't mm -hmm. they? We talk a lot about the professional archaeologists who work with us, but the digger drivers who, you know, will say stop, but then we'll say, well, actually, could you just do that again? Because they didn't get, we were doing it, but they didn't get it on camera. And, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> just to add to working with archaeologists must be annoying enough already without that. <laughs> The skill. It's a very, really good skill, actually. When you meet a digger driver who's worked on any sort of archaeological site, like they're next level because they're able to, they're so, I don't know how to describe it, but, you know, they're able to go million, if you say to them five millimetres only, and they're able to do that and keep their flat, you know, as flat as possible, yeah. no undulations, like, oh, amazing. It's, it's like, I genuinely like, it's going it, to, it just must sound really boring to anyone who hasn't watched a digger um watch anything being machined out but like yeah the, the like how gentle it can be sometimes and I, i'm sounding like a weirdo i know but i think it could be really gentle such a skill yeah yeah, yeah. 18 ton trowel yeah <laughs> and it's also really satisfying to know that most of them are sat there probably earning double than what we do as archaeologists you know so you know <laughs> Two mentions of our wages there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a real moan today. Keeping it we? real. Keeping <laughs> it real. We all do archaeology for the love of it. We've all established that many, many times. Mm. <laughs> um, oh, and by the way, this is Rosie from Bogner Regis. Oh, hi, Rosie. Hello. 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 Hope it's going Rosie. well for you. I think <laughs> you're at university studying something to do with history or archaeology. I'm having a mind blank. I will remember in a few moments but great to see you thank you so much yeah we'll see we'll 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 uh rosie was you'll yeah. see rosie when the i think it's the last episode of the series i think Bogner on isn't it so in july you will meet rosie on tv in july <laughs> <laughs> so, um we've got one of my uh, students as well who's who's here at the moment was filming with us because we had some students in the third episode that's going to be airing as well so. yeah so I've just realized we've been going, we've been chatting for 40 minutes. So let's try slowly to start. Let's, let's focus on the Roman archaeology. Chris Smart, is there anything that you need to say about the dig that we haven't covered yet? Priority is for you. <laughs> okay. The Roman road. Let's go with that one because you started off talking about the Roman road a, a while ago and we kind of dipped out of it. The important thing about the Roman road, and not as a plug of the other work we've been doing, but it kind of is, is... Obviously, the Great British Dig is all about the community and the volunteers. Now, I've, for the past sort of year and a half since COVID, I've been in a big volunteer project working with uh, airborne LIDAR data. So that's a means of laser scanning the Earth's surface to produce a high resolution topographic map. One of the key results of that over the counties of Devon and Cornwall is, is, is that our road leading out of the west gate of the fort connects to a much larger network of Roman roads that cross all, all, all across both counties. And that's only become apparent in the past year and a half from this big crowdsource project looking at um, this LIDAR data. So our road that we excavated is one part of a huge network that basically goes from the north coast of Devon and the River Parrot, so where it goes into Somerset all the way down into West Cornwall. 
so yeah the roman road to actually see its physical construction um and date it when the team left actually i know we, the, the the footage uh, that was aired on thursday showed the nice surface the cambered surface of the road and the excavated ditches just because of the nature of some of the volunteers and myself when you'd gone actually we did actually cut a section through the road so we we're able to see how it was made in profile and it was really well built in three or four layers uh, of bedding material all the way through to the finest surface and sealed beneath the road were a couple more roman coins and a big chunk of amphora so really nice dating sequence but yeah it's a really well made road and based on analogy with all of the lidar anomalies we can see that this pattern extended across the southwest so you know the work is is going and there's some commercial excavations near plymouth for example which have identified a, lo a long section of road um that has got a radio uh, uh, scientific osl date which is making it look roman in origin as well so the work that was done as part of the program is actually really important in kind of helping us understand how these earthworks are made because you don't really get many opportunities to dig across them so yeah that's a really 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 important aspect um in terms of the mining evidence i've not really progressed that any further because it means we'd have to go back in the field and start thinking about where the material is excavated talking to um a geologist who has, has advised us throughout of our, our work he actually links the mineral deposits as being from the opposite side of the river tamar uh, where we were looking at the medieval silver mine so he thinks that the deposits are perhaps being mined um, on the opposite bank of the tamar but um, yet to be confirmed uh, so no, some, some really important evidence came out of that and links with sort of ongoing agendas. Um, yeah. What's next uh, for your project? Oh, sorry. What were you going to no, say? No, I was going to say that's really exciting because um, it's good to hear more about that mining evidence because I, yeah. really, I was really excited about that myself. And yeah. um, it's, it's one of those problems with mines, actually, with understanding mines is that the early mines are always sort of, I mean, how do you put it? You know, you, you, you dig a mine shaft Mm. If you then come in later and expand that mine shaft, well, yeah. you're looking for a hole within a hole, it's not yeah. there, it's not um, which there. is why it's so important to find that evidence and be able to mm. link it. Yeah, I mean, what's what's become interesting, Chloe, is the fact that where I've spent two years surveying what we believe to be medieval mines on the opposite side of the river we never actually excavated any of them so we have surface working which we assume based on documentary evidence are medieval now the question is are any of those surface workings that run into some shaft and gallery mines are any of those actually roman in origin so i'm trying to think of a kind of a an easy way into answering that question versus trying to go in blind with excavation so it may be that we try and pursue some metal strategic metal detecting along the lines of the deposits to see if we find any concentrations of roman coins where they're not known so it's an area where there's no known roman material so if we start finding roman coins for example then it would be a good indication so it's made me rethink about some of the interpretations um from our original medieval project um interestingly we as, as part of the work that i've just done and some earlier excavations actually we identified an elizabethan phase of copper mining on that same hilltop where we were all working um so we now know that there's some you know in the 1500s that um the elizabeth first basically commissioned uh the crown uh, the mines royal to operate in devon and cornwall and that's some of the evidence we've got and we excavated big dumps of that material over the past week or so so there's there's also a precedent for sort of pre-modern mining um, on copper deposits so it might be interesting to know whether any of our mineralized material includes some of the copper as well that's great mm. is there any records of the mining industry there before i mean i'm, I'm wondering why did you actually decide to look there for mm -hmm. evidence of mining industry because yeah. now you've found several phases like yeah the, because the the crown accounts so these are from the late 13 uh, late 1200s into the 1300s basically tell us that the in the administration of the industry was moved between various points in the region based on the availability of wood for fuel so they moved it from one parish so the mines are operating on in the beer peninsula so on the opposite side of the river to council but they're having to move the industry to where the processing and refining is taking place around the landscape according to where there's woodland available and um, the crown basically over exploited woodland um, in one part and then we know they move the industry to Calstock. And there are sort of references to smelting near the church and other kind of geographical references. Uh, now we know there's a fort there. There's the reference to smelting at Vetus Castrum de Calistoc, the old castle at Calistoc, probably ties again to the fort um, because we know the fort survived as, a, as an infilled earthwork into the probably the 9th and 10th centuries because we find early medieval ceramics in the very upper part of the infilled earthworks. Um, so I think, yeah, all of those, all of those 
pointers in the documents were telling us to go to Kelso looking. Um, but yeah, the, 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 interestingly, the earliest known mining in that landscape is taking place well into the 1700s. So to find the Elizabethan phase is pushing back. We know there's documentary evidence for copper mining in Cornwall in the Elizabethan era, but there's been no actual dated um sort of workings so to find an elizabeth the first silver coin in a my infield mine shaft was pretty good really as well much later in time but another first in terms of proving where mining was happening at a specific point in time so cool never thought i'd be interested in mining but no, I to be honest, neither, neither did i especially sort of post-medieval mining but um you know early post-medieval but yeah Ooh. I mean, the read the the site itself. It sits in the middle of of one of the richest um, dist mineral districts in the UK. It's in the middle of a World Heritage site. Um, so actually, to be able to, and the inscription for the World Heritage site is all based on the post medieval industry. So to be able to push that back, first of all, we were you know great to be able to push it into the medieval period. But to take the industry back to the Roman period now is is really important, and hopefully some of that will feed through to the the wording maybe of the of the World Heritage site inscription. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's a huge, uh, huge yeah. thing, actually, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think for me it was super interesting because I actually did start my career off as a curator being interested in re researching post-medieval mining so I was that person who was interested in post-medieval mining but uh <laughs> so for me this was a really really fascinating site and it's a really good example I think what we're able to do in with the Great British Dig in terms of building on some of the great work that Chris has already done and, and filling in little pl places that Chris hadn't got to mm. just yet um, yeah. has been really, really exciting. And we've been able to do that in other places and, and as well. You know, um, Falkirk, another Roman fort where we went to, we really um, were able to fill in gaps there and, and advance the understanding of the, of, of the archaeology of that fort. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the most exciting. This is probably, I think, potentially the best example that I can think of really of, from the various programmes we've done where we have been able through what the great british dig can let us do not only to obviously provide some real excitement and interest for the community but also have a really really good archaeological outcome as well which mm. um is always what i hope is going to happen when i'm looking for sites and talking to people in with just a few weeks in order to find various sites and places to go is you know, I'm really hoping that we can achieve both of those things, and mm. so in this instance, it's it's worked out really, really well. I think that we've been able to do that, which is you know such a, a, a um, testament really to everybody's work on the project, particularly obviously the people from Calstock themselves, who obviously largely dug lots of this stuff with us. Mm. How, how many um, of your scouting sort of ventures, Chris, result in a dead end? So how many, how many, loads. how many leads? Okay, so you do make loads of contacts loads. to end up with your shortlist. Yeah, yeah, very much. So, I think, um, and they come from stuff comes from all over the place. Um, at, but a lot of things to make the program work is is difficult because there's a lot of things that need to be to fit with what we do, to fit with what we can do as well so we don't um want ever to take on archaeology or projects that we can't do justice to i think that obviously that's that's really important to to the, the entire team um not i mean and not only just from an archaeological perspective as well to be honest from a tv perspective it's pointless mm. trying to tell a story that's just too big mm. for an, an hour of tv um so it's important to try and find places where we can do justice to the stuff but also there's a reason and a benefit to to us mm. being there to do the yeah. work and actually that instantly narrows down all of the possible archaeology of Britain mm. down to a, a very limited set of places and circumstances where where it kind of works so when I do find ones it's uh that that work and um or places where we can have the right people to work with obviously it's super exciting for me because it ticks another one off the list it's also in places where you don't normally see on tv and that's what i really love about it it's showcasing these plays that we don't have the opportunity to normally see in, in other sort of medias so I, I really like it 
I like yeah. the, I, I've loved where we've actually gone. Yeah, places we've gone to. The the community aspect is just as as just as important as well. There's there's obviously lots of fields in the middle of nowhere where, where we could go and mm. and excavate some archaeology, but um and that would be great and in, it'd be in some ways much more much easier. But actually, the program is about trying to invest people and and also explore that investment of people in the in the history of where they live so it's about putting those two things together not just it's not only 50 percent really of, of what i'm looking for is mm. the archaeology the other 50 percent needs to be about the people that live yeah. there and, yeah. and the community around that history i mean i i think like i don't think you go you don't go into archaeology if you're not interested in people i don't think you know because there are plenty of disciplines where you can you can look for rocks or dinosaurs or other things with digging. So it's uh, it's uh, like so much a part of it, isn't it? Like the community aspect. Yeah. The people. Well, I think we've probably looked at thousands of site of potential sites, and we've now done. Is it about twenty-two programs, something like that, over the um, the various series of the Great British Dig? So it's yeah, it's quite a it's okay. fairly. I've got a quite high miss rate. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> Okay. We actually have before. Is that okay if I just sorry? Am I going to cut someone? No. Okay. Cool. Um. So actually, we have a perfect timed question, and actually, I'm really happy for this question. So thank you, Todd. Uh. So they've asked, does "Great" in the title and "Great British Bake Off" refer to Great Britain or the Dig Bake Off shows? Now, I love this question because I'll oh, go. I can see Chloe wants to answer it. Go on, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, no, all I can tell you is that when we made the pilot, it was called the Great Big Dig. Um, but I do like to think of it as um, I do. Yeah, I do love how many of these great British programs there are. I, I can just I can sort of I think I can say this. Um, I badgered Hugh relentlessly for about two years until he gave me tickets to go and be in the audience for Mock the Week. And when I did that, it doesn't. It didn't make the edit of the show, but they sat there and they started saying, "Oh, why are there all these programs called Great British This, Great British That?" And he just sat there very quietly, going, <laughs> <laughs> "It's the format. It's a Channel Four format, of course. It's like from my point of view, but also, yeah, I mean, we I do travel. It was a great show, isn't it, Ashton? The greatest show, yes, yeah. the greatest archaeology show. Well, a bunch of my friends tuned in." The Thursday before last, because the Great British Dog Walks was in the same slot on Moor Four. So on the TV guide, it was like the Great British D. And all my friends, like, I had one mate, <laughs> my, one mate jumped out of the shower thinking he was going to miss it. And then he was like, What's, what's with all these dogs? Wait, you, your mates are loyal. No one I know watches it. Well, no one watches the show. I, I threaten them. Doesn't watch. <laughs> threaten them with violence. <laughs> It just reminds me as well. So I won't say on here, but it just reminds me how Sasha would pronounce the show. We can't say that on here, but uh, yeah, it just reminded me. <laughs> um, you have to Who's... imagine it, Chris Smart. You've got to imagine Who's it. Sasha, Sasha, you can't talk about characters. Ukrainian <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't just talk about characters. That's not know, on the like... show. Technically, Sasha is in um, Dig HQ in a scene, the community day scene. <laughs> You see his like you can see his blurred out jumper. So there you go. Yeah, Tash's Tash's husband is another of the long suffering uh, hidden hidden heroes behind the Great British Dig. <laughs> I'm not suggesting he's one, suffering one or two he's to you. I didn't mean that. I just <laughs> never mind. Like, shut it down. Stop. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. What are you going to say? I was just going to say that he's also been involved in backfilling one or two trenches uh, with yeah. some archaeologists. So. You know, he hasn't, got away, he hasn't got away scot free. No, no, no. <laughs> Coming from a Scot, yeah, yeah. Got your got your Scot. Oh yeah. Indiana Jones whip out. Yeah. <laughs> no. So Chris Smart, we had um, I think it's our biggest <clears throat> trench we had, isn't it? Hand excavated and backfilled. I think that one was in um in Scotland. We had that one. <laughs> that was fun. Actually, it was such quite a good dig. That was a fun dig overall. <laughs> Chloe's last minute trench. I remember. Okay, <laughs> one second. Yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, that was, you know, you could tell I dug that trench really fast and got really sweaty because I look really disgusting in that episode. Like, I'm just caked in 
like dirt and it's sweat. Organic. Sticking. It's organic. That is an archaeologist, <laughs> you know. The one time I worked hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you got it on camera, so it's fine. <laughs> it's proof. I did it. <laughs> right. We're, I just realized we're coming up to the hour mark. So we've got three minutes left. No pressure. Three minutes left. Okay. John Henry, tell oh. us a joke. <laughs> Actually, can you can you sing a song for us? You're really good at singing random songs on the spot. I'd like a song no, about cow stock. No, no. Um, a few key words that I need. We're gonna get some. No. Let's get Samian in there. It's not, let's well, get it's the not, fact that we it's had not three. Gonna, it's not gonna happen. So it's gonna happen. Yeah, you, I know <laughs> no. you got. I can see your guitar in the back. Yeah, no, it's not. Happening. Sorry, we me. haven't even discussed the the the, the Great British did karaoke night. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> nailed that. It's not well, for now. So That's myself. Fun. <laughs> that was fun. Chris Smart, you weren't there. You probably didn't miss much. I mean, it wasn't. No. We didn't do it in Calstock and just not invite you, Chris. It was that's a okay. The yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Nottingham, wasn't it? Yeah. And I did um, Elvis. We did it, didn't we? Yeah, I think well, the two. I mean, of you, I mean did you count? You, you didn't contribute much, Tash. I'll be honest, but you know. The but thought, I was there for moral support. Yeah, you, you were filming it and laughing. I think Tash made it entertaining. Ooh. You gave it some real, like, you tried really hard. You worked really hard. <laughs> I don't know about that. No, oh, Sasha filmed it. I was on, I was with you. Oh, I, I was with, know. I'm in the video clip. What are you Look, talking about? It, it was a party, I don't remember. <laughs> anyway, there we go. That's so one minute. We're enjoying how much fun we have on this project. Mm. We do. We are very lucky to be able to say that we work with mates and then we make new mates along the way as well i mean both chris i guess you knew each other before but now chris no 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 no, no, oh, no there you no, go no, no, it's, no. it's not like a chris group that all the people <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all archaeologists chris. called chris we all yeah, all <laughs> yeah. you didn't have a, a meet up network. <laughs> remember they had that meet up for the for everyone called nigel maybe we should do the same thing everyone called chris in archaeology <laughs> good work yeah so my, my my question is: Is there going to be another series? Ooh. Do Ooh. none of you know? We we never know no. uh, and, until we find out if it's been commissioned. Mm. Fingers crossed, because I've got a corker of a site that I'd like to work at. Mm. Yeah. You know which one I mean, Chris Scott. I do. Yeah, is it, is um, it up north by any chance? <laughs> no, no, I'm it's always not. looking for one at the end of my garden. Not, <laughs> so, um, oh, it's not. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I do yeah. know where this one wasn't, was it? This episode wasn't up north, actually. So. No, no. I had the longest commute of ev- all of you. When... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, is, is, that, is, is, is the reason that we've got quite a few sites in the north to do with your commute, commuting distance, Chris? Is that, <laughs> one of them, is that the mysterious X factor in the site? Of course it is. Of course it is. <laughs> look at him. You ever seen a man look so guilty? <laughs> <laughs> It's just promoting regional investment in the north, isn't it? Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. yeah, we've got to have something going on. There's, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, so in answer to your question, Tass, we gen- none of us know, unfortunately. Uh, um, oh, sorry, Chris's question. We just don't know what's going to happen, and it unfortunately we we never find out till sometimes quite close to the I- ideal sort of filming mm-hmm. slot. So. That's that's when I really start to get stressed about finding places where we can go and uh, and do some archaeology in the right place that will mm. actually help. So, but for our, for our viewers at home, you know, if you love the show, it'll be great if you can show your support by sharing it online, watching it on demand, you know, sharing the link with other people as well. That's how you can help us continue showing archaeology on Channel 4 because it's obviously our passion. We love doing it. And let's make archaeology more mainstream. Come on. We've got to do it. History is important. British heritage is important. And we have a way of combining all of it and getting people involved and showing that archaeology is for everyone everyone yeah so with that it is seven o'clock is there anything that anybody would like to say before we do end the live stream before no pressure. you're always welcome to come back and dig some more how about that <laughs> bit of mining yeah, yeah. i'm gonna write that down yeah <laughs> and it's on the live stream <laughs> now yeah, yeah it's fine no, you no. know they're gonna be holding you to it <laughs> i do i actually do want to thank chris and all the community 
um, his community archaeology project and everyone involved in that because it really was such a cool episode and mm. I, I was so grateful to you for letting us you know go and fertile about in your holes as it were yeah uh, it um, yeah I mean it, but I had the ultimate trust I mean Chris is obviously a very convincing man because um, yeah I kind of said yes I met him and Audrey and I said yes but you know other people wouldn't have been so convincing I think so yeah but yeah, no, um, def from myself as well, obviously, just a, a huge thank you to every, Chris and everyone in Calstock who made us so welcome mm -hmm. um, and who berated John Henry in the pub and, <laughs> and so on. We did. We had a brilliant time and it was a, mm. um, it was genuinely stunningly beautiful, but also such a friendly place to work. Yeah, well, thank it. you so much. So with that, I should say thank you to everyone who's tuned in to the live stream. Special thank yous to everyone who's left a comment in the in the comment section. So we've got Steve, Nigel, Alex, or Sasha, actually. I see that's you, Sasha. Rosie, Beautiful World, Inez. And that's it. So thank you so much for tuning in and for your lovely comments. And we will see you next week. It'll be on Tuesday. I will be making the live stream post very shortly not very shortly maybe tomorrow maybe the day after um uh, so just subscribe to the channel you'll get notified when we uh have the new live stream pop up but it'll be on tuesday 6 p.m so please get your questions ready for when you watch the show which will be on thursday at 9 p.m on more four and then there's apparently a repeat on the weekend i think on saturdays midday i'm not sure the exact time um but so please watch it and it's always on catch up anyway if you missed the first one yes yes and conan yes you did miss it but don't worry it's youtube you can scroll back and actually it's good that you've missed an hour of us rambling can I choose the bits that you want to listen to <laughs> so with that thank you so much for tuning in I am now going to end the live stream so bye have a look I